Well, as everyone knows, the IoT world is important, and it's important to us at CWNP as we develop this new IoT track. And so one of the things we wanted to do this year is make sure you got exposure to several of the different protocols that are utilized within that space, not just in the pre-conference boot camps, but also in some of the presentations. One of the reasons for this is in the Wi-Fi space, we can learn a lot from the IoT space, but also because these protocols are making their ways into our networks. So we have to know how to deal with them. In this session, Troy Martin is going to be talking to us about one of the important protocols that's used in the industrial space quite a lot, and that is one called Wireless Heart. Maybe you've heard of Heart, a wireline protocol that has been popular in those environments for a long time. Wireless Heart is the wireless specification for those Heart networks to allow field devices to communicate. Well, I'm not going to steal his thunder. Troy's going to tell you more. So let's hear what Troy has to say about Wireless Heart. Hello. For the next 30 minutes, I'll be speaking about Wireless Heart to provide an overview of the technology. First, I want to say thank you to CWMP for bringing us all together virtually to share knowledge, information, and our experiences. Let's take a moment and explore the narrative in the movie Lucy. In this movie, Lucy has an unwanted bag of drugs surgically implanted into her abdomen. The bag leaks and the drugs within start reacting with the cells of her body, providing her enhanced mental capacity. Shortly after, Lucy contacts a scientist who has been researching the implications of enhanced mental capacity and access to this information. Now, the Coles Notes version of the scientist's research can be summed up in this short story. Once life started to develop, it took roughly 400,000 years before the first nerve cells appeared. Early use of neurons did not indicate intelligence. It served more as a reflex. One neuron meant you were alive. With two neurons, you were moving. Once we had movement, interesting things began to happen. Most species use three to 5% of their cerebral capacity. At the top of the animal chain, we find humans, which are believed to be able to use upwards of 10% of their cerebral capacity. 10% may not seem like a lot, but look at all that we have done with it. We can also look at the special case. The only living being that uses more of its brain power than humans is the dolphin. This creature uses upwards of 20% of its cerebral capacity. This allows it to have an echolocation system far more efficient than any sonar system developed by mankind. Dolphins did not invent sonar, they developed it. Now let's hypothesize if we could access 20% of our brain. This would give us information to our own body. We might be able to locate objects from a distance, perceive a broader spectrum of light, sound, and electrical impulses. We might have access to our body's metabolism, manage our heartbeat and cell production. We might even be able to prioritize repairs to damaged cells and organs. There are 100 billion neurons per human. This is roughly the same number of connections in the human body as there are stars in the galaxy. We possess a gigantic network of information to which we have almost no access. The next stage of enhanced mental capacity could possibly be control of other people, but for this, we would require roughly 40% of our brain's capacity. What follows after control of ourselves and others is control of matter. But now we're entering the realm of science fiction. And we don't know any more than a wolf knows when it stares up at the moon and howls. Now imagine a film with a car speeding down the road. If you loop this film and speed up the image infinitely, the car disappears. So what proof do we have of its existence? Time gives legitimacy to its existence. Time is the only true unit of measure. It gives proof to the existence of matter. Without time, we do not exist. All right, all right, enough philosophizing for the moment. 
What if we looked at the process control plant as a collection of billions of neurons, with each neuron containing information waiting to be accessed? What if we had access to just a portion of that information? We could use it to optimize workflows, schedule necessary maintenance during turnarounds, produce higher yields, doing this more efficiently, all while generating less waste. The information out there is limitless. We just need a network to access it and bring it all together. My name is Troy Martin, and I've worked on many projects in the industrial process control settings. You can reach me on Twitter at Troy Mart or search for me on LinkedIn. During this presentation, I'll be in the chat room trying to answer any questions that come up in real time. However, if I'm not able to answer your question, or you happen to be watching this video at a later, later time, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or via LinkedIn. Now, while I'm presenting on Wireless Heart, I also want to give a shout out to Landon Foster. For those of you working in the process control space, there are two leading wireless technologies, Wireless Heart and ISA 100.11a, the latter of which Landon will be presenting during the conference on Friday morning. Here's a list of what we're going to cover in the next half hour or so. We're going to quickly go through some of the highlights or the geeky buzzwords for Wireless Heart. We'll talk about the history of Heart and its evolution towards a wireless protocol. We'll talk about what makes up the protocol itself, looking at spectrum and channel allocation, modulation, frame types and structures, as well as routing techniques. We'll talk about design best practices and how site surveys play a role or how they might not play a role, as well as four golden rules uh, that we can use to place end devices across our plant. And we'll wrap things up talking about some highlights of security. All right, let's get some geeky stuff out of the way. Wireless Heart is a self-configuring, self-optimizing, and self-healing wireless mesh protocol. It's based on the IEEE 802.15.4 standard published in 2006. Now, this was selected in part due to the low power requirements. This standard allows extended operation for devices using batteries. Alternatively, power can be scavenged from vibrations such as wind or via solar panels. Reliability is achieved by building a mesh network with redundant network paths and connections. And Wireless Heart was first defined in 2007 with release of Heart version 7 standard by the Heart Foundation. And Wireless Heart later gained international recognition when Heart 7 was used as the basis for the IEC 62951 standard. All right, now let's step back and take a look at Heart history. Where have things come from? Current loops, often referred to as 420 milliamp loops, are analog circuits used to transfer electronic signaling. Now, current loops naturally allow for self monitoring where reading of zero milliamps or no current indicates a break in the loop. Simply stated, any reported values outside the range of four through 20 milliamps indicate a failure. In the lower left-hand image on the slide, you see an empty tank with 0% product or the lower range limit set to four milliamps. At 50% capacity, the output current is 12 milliamps. At 100% tank capacity, the output current is 20 milliamps or the upper range limit. Converting these values from analog to digital with 16-bit fields allows for over 65,000 discrete values that can be used to measure and record data. Now, Hart uses the Bell 202 standard, which is also used to transmit caller ID information over the POTS lines in the telephone network. Bell 202 allowed a digital signal to be superimposed on top of an analog wave form, thereby conveying additional information. Superimposing a digital signal along with an analog signal does not impact the analog wave. Each crest of the overlaid digital waveform is equally matched with the corresponding trough. The two halves of the sine wave cancel each other out, resulting in no effect on the analog signal. Now, Hart was originally developed by Rosemont Communications and uses a hybrid analog to digital signal. In 1986, it was made into an open standard. In 2015, the Heart Communication Foundation merged with the Fieldbus Foundation as a single entity to become the Fieldcom Group. Today, the Fieldcom Group maintains the Heart standard. 
Lastly, HART is an acronym for Highway Addressable Remote Transducer. Wireless HART itself is designed to be used in the process industry. It can be used during the automotive production process as part of assembly lines. It can be used in chemical segments for manufacturing of plastics or the petrochemical process. It can be used in food and beverage during large scale brewing, bottling and processing. Finally, it can be used as part of power generation. Gaining access to this information allows operators to monitor and control pressure and temperature of process fluids and gases, improve control of plant steam supplies by detecting leaks in cross plant steam lines. It allows operators to reduce the risk of overfilling tanks by adding redundant level measurements. It also allows operators to monitor and control flow by communicating with valves. Wireless Heart was the first open and interoperable wireless standard to address the critical needs of real world industrial applications. It adds wireless capabilities to the existing Heart protocol while maintaining backwards compatibility with existing devices, commands, and tools. Today, there are over 50,000 wireless field networks in operation, exceeding 17 billion hours of operating experience. All right, now let's dive into some fundamental concepts of the protocol, but first let's discuss the components of a wireless heart system. First off, we have the network manager. Think of this like a centralized brain. It manages the network and its devices. It collects topology information. It performs routing or best path calculations. It also analyzes health reports sent in from end devices, which are then used during forming and grooming of graph routes. It also generates scheduling algorithms based on optimization targets, and this allows for reduced response time, increased reliability, and greater power efficiency. The network manager also generates network management packets to devices such as advertisement frames or other broadcast messages. It will also recompute routes when there are topology changes or when links break. Finally, redundant network managers are supported However, only one can be active at a time. The next component are the gateways or the access points. As a rule of thumb, one gateway can support up to 100 devices. A gateway provides one or more host interface, interfaces connecting to the gateway, connecting the gateway to a backbone network such as the plant automation network. Now, one or more access points also provides physical connections into the wireless heart network. Gateways provide a connection to the network manager, which we just discussed, and they also provide buffering and local storage for the publishing of data, event notification, and distribution of common commands. Gateways also act as a time source for synchronization. The next component is a wireless field device, which is a native wireless heart uh, capable sensor. They're deployed out in the field, and these can be devices that sense uh, perform actu um, actuations or a combination of both. They may be inline, battery powered, or use an alternative method of energy harvesting. We also have wireless adapters. Now these adapters enable communication with a non-wireless heart device through a wireless heart network by adding a radio and antenna to legacy heart devices. We also have handheld devices which are portable units that run applications used to configure, maintain, and control plant assets. These are the devices that we use to pre-configure endpoints with join keys and network IDs. Also, to provide some additional context, we have the plant automation network, which connects client applications to the gateway, and the gateway has redundant connections back to the plant automation network. Lastly, because the S in IoT stands for security, there is also a security manager, which is the service that runs on the gateway, which is responsible for generating and distributing keys. Now, the Purdue model was developed as an enterprise lifecycle reference architecture that supports up to six layers. Sensors themselves exist down at layer zero in the process network, and they should be isolated from the enterprise zone up at the top via an industrial grade DMZ. The next two slides are here for reference. Here, we have the scope from the data link layer perspective. 
The takeaway from this slide is that the heart standard defines the full seven layers of the OSI model, all the way from the physical to the application layer. In this slide, we have the scope from the network layer perspective. Here we can see that wireless heart uses time division multiple access or TDMA on top of 802.15.4 physical and Mac layer frame structures. As mentioned earlier, wireless heart operates on the 2.4 gigahertz band. 802.15.4 defines 16 channels. However, for global support, wireless heart only uses the first 15 channels. Each channel is two megahertz wide with the center frequencies between these channels spaced at five megahertz apart. The radio transceivers are, are half duplex transmitters and they use channel hopping. Each device has a channel map, which it uses to perform hops on a per packet or per time slot basis. The same channel is not used in consecutive transmissions, which enhances reliability. Now keep in mind, all 15 channels could be used simultaneously given enough end devices in the same proximity or environment. Wireless heart operates at a maximum throughput of 250 kilobits per second. Each symbol is encoded with four, with four bits for a rate of 62.5 kilobods per second. The 16 different four-bit symbols are mapped to a defined pattern of chip codes uh, before they're sent across the airwaves. Reliability in wireless heart is achieved through time diversity, channel hopping. It also has the ability to blacklist channels or restrict hopping to certain channels. There's also route diversity and power diversity. The IEEE 802.15.4 standard uh, provides modulations defined by BPSK and parallel sequence spread spectrum or PSSS. The modulation used by wireless heart is offset quadrature phase shift keying, sometimes called staggered QPSK. Now, lower point devices run more efficiently or low, low power devices run more efficiently if we drive a power amplifier into saturation, meaning we yield more transmit power versus the needed DC input power. However, a side effect of this produces something called spectral regrowth. Now offset QPSK is used to minimize the number of modulated bit changes at the same time. Regular QPSK symbols can allow the phase shift to jump by as much as 180 degrees at a time. And this is marked by the dotted red lines in the upper left constellation chart shown on the slide. When passed through a low pass filter, these phase shifts result in large amplitude fluctuations, which negatively impact signal quality. By offsetting the timing of the odd and even bits by one bit period or half a symbol period, the in phase and quadrature components will never change at the same time. The end result is a phase shift of no more than 90 degrees at a time. With offset QPSK, phase shifts do not lead to transitions through zero, reducing the impact from spectral regrowth and, uh, and produce greater quality in the signal. During network initialization, a wireless network automatically starts up and self-organizes. Before a network can form, a network manager and a gateway must exist. The network manager activates the first super frame. This establishes the system epoch ASN0. Once the network access points start to advertise, devices can begin to join the network. As devices join, the network forms. Advertisement packets are used as a way to say hello to new devices wanting to connect to the mesh. They are woven into super frames and sent periodically. Keep alive frames are sent no more frequent than once per 30 seconds. Data frames carry the information that we're really interested in. This is the information about the monitor and control and diagnostic data of our process control system. Acknowledgements are sent within the 10 millisecond time slots. Now, one thing to take away is devices receiving a packet with an unknown packet type must not acknowledge the packet and it's marked for immediate discard. Finally, disconnect frames serve as a civil way to inform the network manager a node or a path is being removed and a new graph route needs to be calculated and distributed to all the endpoints. The preamble, start frame delimiter, 
and the length field precede the physical service data unit or PSDU. According to the HART standard, the PSDU is limited to 127 bytes. This is also the data link packet data unit or DLPDU, which is shown in the center frame sequence. Formatting in the HART fields follows the 802.15.4 standard. However, some fields represent different information. Now source and destination addresses can be either two byte or eight byte values. When initially joining the network, the address fields use EUI64 values for identification. Once registered with the network manager, a two byte nickname is assigned, allowing the devices to reduce the size of the frames by 12 bytes on subsequent exchanges. The DLL payload is validated for integrity at this layer using a message integrity check, but the payload itself is not encrypted between hops. The network layer provides routing, end-to-end -end security, and transport services. The DLPDU packet contains in its payload a network layer protocol data unit, or NPDU. The NPDU contains three layers. The first is the network layer with routing and packet time information. The next is the security layer that ensures private communication and enciphered payload containing information being exchanged over the network. The third layer is the transport layer, which provides a means to ensure end-to-end -end packet delivery, device status, and one or more commands. Enciphered payload of the security layer contains the transport layer protocol data unit, or the TPDU. The structure of the TPDU packet is shown in the top frame sequence, which can contain multiple command sequences. A little commentary on routing. Graph routing defines a path that connects different devices on the network. The network manager is responsible for creating the graphs and configuring them on each device through transport layer commands. Graphs show a set of direct links between endpoints, including redundant paths. The source device of a packet writes the specific graph ID number in the NPDU header. All devices on the path must be pre-configured with graph information provided by the network manager that specifies the neighbors to which the packets may be forwarded. Source routing provides one single directed path between source and destination devices. A list of devices that the packet must travel through is statically specified in the NPDU header of the packet. This method removes the need for the network manager to provide graphs and routes for every device. With superframe routing, packets are assigned to a specific superframe, and the device sends the message according to the identification of the superframe. The forwarding device selects the first available slot in the superframe and sends the message. So, the superframe must have links that lead, to lead a packet to its destination. At least one superframe is always enabled. All devices must support multiple superframes, and the slot sizes and super frame length are fixed and form a network cycle with a fixed repetition rate. Breaking down the super frame, we find a series of slots. The one shown in this slide happens to include some sleep slots, which can be used for unscheduled communication, such as device joins or sending alarm messages. Now let's move on to the next section to better understand the rules and guidelines for designing wireless heart networks. In your process plant, you can have thousands of sensors that could be deployed, and it's difficult to accurately model dense process plant environments. These process control environments are challenging RF settings, and many facilities exist as green fields, only on CAD drawings when the wireless heart network needs to be designed. Now remember, wireless heart is a self-configuring, self-healing, self-optimizing, and there's no need to develop complicated frequency channel plans. All of this leads us down a path where site surveys become more costly and time consuming than they're worth. In order to get around that, we've come up with a series of golden rules to ease your design considerations. Rule number one is the rule of five, and this states that a minimum of five devices must be within direct range or one hop from the gateway. There can be more, which is great. Uh, there can be fewer, but in order to achieve the three nines reliability target, you need at least five within that range. 
The next rule, the rule of three, states that every device should have a minimum of three neighbors. This ensures that there are at least two connections or two diverse paths to take to get back to the gateway. Now, the mesh will still work if there are fewer connections, but again, your reliability can suffer. Rule three, or the rule of percentages. This one's a little bit more complicated, and it states that network, uh, a network with more than five devices should have 25% of those devices within effective range or within one hop of the gateway. Now, the effective range numbers are shown in the table on the slide, and these values are based on high-level assumptions about signal propagation through various common materials that one would find in the process environment. Now, networks with high update rates that exceed two seconds should change this number from 25% to 50%. Rule number four, the rule of maximum distance, also has to do with update times, which can be anywhere from one second to 60 minutes. Now, the faster the update times, the fewer the number of devices that can be supported by the gateway. In addition, these devices with faster update times need to be closer to the gateway with more direct hops. This slide summarizes the design rules in one convenient page. Mounting guidelines for design documents and installers can be summarized here. Devices, or specifically the antenna, should be mounted um, more than half a meter away from any vertical surface. The sweet spot for mounting the antennas, or in particular the gateways, is roughly four to eight meters above the ground. All the antennas should be aligned vertical, and do not forget weatherproofing and lightning arrestor requirements. You can see the lightning protectors and the images on the slide connected in line on the side of the device and not on the side of the antenna. All right, let's move into the home stretch and talk about some security. The network ID is an integer value ranging from 0 to 65,535. You can think of the network ID like a network name or identifier of your wireless heart network and there can be parallel wireless networks operating in the same environment distinguished by their network ID value. All keys that are used by wireless heart are NIST compliant AES 128-bit encryptions. The network key itself is used for hop-by-hop -hop communications and it uses a message integrity check uh, calculation to ensure message authentication and verification regarding the source and the receiver on a hop-by-hop -hop communication. Devices must also have a join key. This is pre-configured on the device using that handheld device we talked about earlier or some sort of ma asset management software. Optionally, the join key can be a common or global key. Alternatively, it can be a unique key assigned um, per device or per end device. Now guess which method is typically selected in production. Finally, individual device session keys are used to ensure end-to-end -end message authenticity, data integrity, receipt validation, and secrecy through data encryption. So data encryption is only done end-to-end, -end, while integrity is only dealt with on a hop-by-hop -hop basis. Here you can see some of the default join keys used within uh, typical vendor wireless heart deployments. And if you were to enter these hex values into a hex to ASCII decoder, you'd find some interesting uh, Easter eggs. Like the first one translates into uh, Dust Network's Rock. Uh, the last one, Endress and Hauser. You also see some default network keys as defined by the Heart standard, uh, with a default key taking you to the heart.com or the heart.com uh, uh, website. Lastly, we have uh, some quick bullet points on how you can improve the security of your wireless heart deployment. But it's important to remember that wireless communication will always be vulnerable to jamming attacks. There are a lot of countermeasures built within the wireless heart protocol itself, but any wideband jamming can only be resolved by identifying that source, uh, the source of the interfering signal and physically powering it down. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, some packet capturing for wireless heart. There are some adapters you can buy. Uh, the NXP KW41Z, for example, it's a Zigbee BLE-based sniffer that runs a Windows-based software. You would require 15 of these devices to capture all the wireless heart channels, uh, but running them in parallel, you could merge the PCAPs together and recover information um, as the uh, wireless heart frames uh, hop through those 15 different channels. Uh, alternatively, 
Uh, the Heart Foundation provides a, a unit of hardware called the uh, Wi-Fi analysis. It uh, allows you to capture on all 16 channels, which is interesting that it's all 16 simultaneously. It's a Windows-based device, uh, but it's uh, definitely not cheap uh, to acquire. The last example that I wanna provide is the software development kit, uh, which also includes uh, some hardware devices provided by Analog Devices. They acquired Dust Networks but they provide uh, smart mesh wireless heart starter kits. They also provide a link to a GitHub repository where you can look at some sample code about what's going on uh, to, to capture traffic. On a final note, I wanna leave you with some resources where you can find additional information about wireless hearts. You can look at the IS, IEC 62951 standard. You can also pull down the reference from the FieldCom group, um, as well as this book itself provides a valuable reference. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Troy Mart. All right, Troy, great presentation on Wireless Heart. Um, I think this is it, at the very least the second time you've talked about Wireless Heart, right? Uh, didn't you give a presentation a few years ago as well? Yes, uh, previously at a WLPC conference uh, yes. over in Prague, I believe it was, I presented on 10 minutes on Wireless Heart. That's what I thought. Um, we, we do have a couple questions that have come in, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the product development uh, we were able to partner with you this year on. But um, first of all, a, a really good question, not just about Wireless Heart, but it applies to ISA 100.11a and um, several other protocols actually out there in the industry. And that is, um, is there anything proprietary about it? Can the radio be manufactured by anybody? Of course, not anybody, but anybody that has the ability to develop a radio. So um, what about it? Is it proprietary? Is it something that uh, multiple companies can build devices for? Well, absolutely. So the, the heart uh, or the, the field group prides itself on it being an open standard. Um, although you do have to pay to play. So you have to, you have to, you know, essentially by the standard, but it is open to anybody uh, willing to, to pay for that standard. Um, having said that, uh, there's primarily a, a small number of manufacturers. So Dust Networks uh, makes a significant number of the, the chipsets that are incorporated into these devices. Uh, and Dust Networks was recently acquired by Analog Devices. Uh, so in the, the packet capturing examples that I gave, uh, some of the, uh, the packet capturing tools is a software development kit that's available from Analog Devices to develop a lot of the um, wireless heart applications, which is actually primarily where you find uh, packet capturing hardware. It's, it's more intended for the, the software hardware development side of the house. Yeah, absolutely. And, and at the radio level, what radio are we actually using here? Uh, the actual model number of it? Uh, no, the, uh, the, the protocols that are used at those lower layers of wireless uh, heart. So it, it all has its foundations on the, the 802.15.4 in terms of uh, protocols. And yeah. then wireless heart uh, stacks and augments uh, upon that, defining all the layers one through seven of the Rosai stack. Yeah, and I think you mentioned that earlier on in the presentation too. And, and I, I think that's a key part of the answer to the question is that, well, it's 802.15.4. So as long as you can build on top of it uh, effectively, then it could be implemented. And that's true for uh, several protocols actually that we cover in CWICP. Um, uh, mm -hmm. That would include six low pan and thread and ISA 100.11a, wireless heart. Um, Zigbee, there are quite a few of those out there that actually are 802.15.4 based, but they're also wildly different. So just because layer one, layer two might be primarily 802.15.4 with some modifications and tweaks, um, those protocols do change the way it works quite a bit. Yeah, if, if everyone's given a recipe for a cake, we won't all turn up with, our, we won't all bake the same, same product at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we do have another question that's come in. Uh, they, one uh, attendee has asked, could you repeat which tools you'd recommend for troubleshooting? Yeah, so that's one of the, the challenges I find with uh, IoT and uh, wireless heart as well as the, the troubleshooting side of things. Uh, so you, within the interface of the wireless heart devices uh, with the handheld device or the management application, uh, you do have information to, to view the signal strength that you hear remote devices. So the, there are certain minimum thresholds that you want to hear your neighboring devices. And if uh, you have poor communication, it's most likely due to uh, interference, blocking, um, to, uh, too great of a distance between those points. And so you can measure and prove that's what's happening. And then resolution 
generally in the space is to add more sensors. Uh, you add more sensors, you build a more robust network, and, and sure, it does cost, uh, cost a little bit of money to deploy these additional sensors, but the benefit is when you deploy a sensor, you get more information that you're pulling back into your control room that you can use as part of your automation process. Absolutely. And finally, our, our time's running down for the Q&A, but I just wanted to quickly say, uh, you know, just to show the whole world your varied capabilities and expertise. <laughs> um, not only uh, is he here presenting on Wireless Heart, which is CWICP, uh, if you want to put it in context of our certifications, but also wrote three chapters for CWIIP this last year. So, uh, definitely a very busy man, doing a lot of hard work and helping the industry out a lot. And we just really do appreciate it, Troy. Well, thank you, Tom. And uh, shout out to CWMP and, and yourself, Tom, for, for taking the time and the organizing committee uh, for, the C for the CWP conference. Uh, I, I think it's been fantastic so far. I've been blown away by all the presentations we've heard so far this morning. It's, it's been fantastic, the content. Well, thanks, Troy. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being with us. And I hope to see you soon. All right, take care. All right, bye.